This series is made possible by the generous donation of Stiefel Financial and viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Adrian Cameron. I'm with the Fire Safe Council, and you may have noticed a slight accent. I come from Australia, and Australia holds the reputation of having the worst fire problems in the world, followed closely by California, so I can relate to the situation. And it was only after I had the good fortune of having Terry McMahon, our, our chief fire marshal, come out to look at our house, um, that I realized that I needed some serious advice. So I contacted Fire Safe Council and they came out and um, I looked at the place and they said, well, you need to do this, 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 and this. And then uh, I explained to them that I had done a bit of reading and when they heard how much reading I'd done, uh, they said, well, you're pretty keen about fire safety. I said, it's my life and my wife's life. And um, they said, why don't you become a, a dis defensible space advisor and that was the beginning of it and that was years ago and since then I've become deeply immersed in it and I really really am passionately involved in everything to do with fire safety and there are two aspects of fire safety one is clearing everything around your house that's flammable that needs to be done it doesn't mean going back to bare earth uh, but strategically uh, pruned and placed. And secondly, and probably more importantly, is making your house, the term that's used in the industry is hardened, or you make your structures fire resistant. It's quite fascinating that the smallest thing is your biggest problem. It's the fire embers, which can be blown, as I see in local literature, for from more than a mile away. Let me tell you from statistics, both in Australia and in some parts of the United States, they can come from miles, three, five miles away. They'll be blown through the air and they will land on your property. And the biggest area that you have to be concerned about is your roof, because your roof is a relatively flat and very large structure. And if there's anything up there that can ignite from just a small fire ember or a fire brand, as a lot of people prefer to call them. That can be the beginning of a fire. If you have good roofing, the very minimum would be AC composite tiles. Uh, you can have metal, you can have um, uh, terracotta, you, you can have concrete, you can have all sorts of things, but at least uh, have composite tiles up there and they will not burn if you've got grade A composite tiles. They may melt in a very severe fire, for, for example a branch fell on there and the roof was subject to an extended period of burning. But anything that's there was the beginning of a fire. The more debris that you have on here on the roof, in the, the valleys, in the gutters, uh, in the, uh, uh, up around the dormers, the more likelihood that there will be a sustained fire. And if it's there for long enough, it will melt through the composite tiles. Very rare, but it can happen, which will expose the rafters, and then you have a very serious situation. I've actually caused them. I've actually caused fires in Australia, and people are a little bit shocked when they hear me say I'm here with defensible space advice, you've caused fire, and I was paid to do it. No, I'm not an arsonist working for a criminal gang. Working in conjunction with the, the local county in a rural area, a lot of long grass grows up around people's properties, and they have a lot of acreage. And like so many of us, we neglect to take any action about it. So every year the county will send out notices and say, you've got to cut down your long grass. Do whatever you do, but get rid of the long grass. Otherwise, we will come in or send somebody in to do it. We will charge you and you will also be fined. You can alternatively 
work directly with the uh, independent contractor that we would engage. And on one occasion, a fellow contacted me and he said, uh, I've got a couple of acres down the road there. Uh, you want to have a look at it? And I said, oh, sure. Now, to do this work, I usually had four to six people, and we would limb up the trees, we'd clear around the fences uh, within a five-foot area around the structure, and then deliberately set fire under the ideal conditions and burn out all that, that long grass. Well, this fellow uh, asked me to have a look, and I, I gave him a price because it was on a steep hill, and I had to have at least six fellows uh, there. And I gave him the price, which was a very fair price. I sleep well at night time. I give honest prices. He says, yeah, too bloody expensive, mate. I'm going to do it myself. So he got in his truck, drove over to his property, got out, set fire to the property. He was on his own. At the bottom of the hill. Now, anybody who knows anything about fires knows that fire loves hills, races up the hills. He took out five houses. I never did see him again, but if I had, if I probably would have poked my finger in his chest and said, I would have been cheaper, wouldn't I, mate? <laughs> Fire Safe Council of Nevada County does an incredible job. They receive requests from people all over the county, and it's a large county. And so many of the places that are in the county are in the worst possible situations you could possibly imagine as far as fire protection is concerned. So getting a fire truck to them is not easy. And besides that, you count up the number of properties there are in the county and then count up the number of fire departments and firefighters. Obviously, you're not going to have a fire truck and a firefighter at every single home. So you are the first line of defence. Now, one of the big questions that you will find coming up is, well, how do I get rid of all this stuff? And I can't do this. I'm too old. And various other questions indicating that the people will not be in compliance, even though they have the best of intentions, because many times it's beyond them. So this is where the Fire Safe Council can offer some great services, particularly for those people who, A, uh, don't have the money, or B, uh, don't have the physical ability, or C, just don't have the way of getting rid of everything that they cut down. There is a um, chipping program, which I like to call You Chop, We Chip. So you chop off the bits that need to go, and you can, and it's a very popular service, so sometimes you may have to wait, wait six, eight weeks uh, to get it chipped. So it's best to start as soon as possible, not when the dry weather comes and everything is tinder dry. Do it as soon as you possibly can. We have uh, assistance for elderly people. We have uh, ways of helping them uh, financially. And uh, we cannot recommend anyone, but we do have a list of reputable people who will do tree lopping and garden maintenance and uh, clearing of brush and so on. And if uh, there are other services, but if you call Fire Safe Council at 530-272-1122. If you do decide to avail yourself of the chipping program, just a couple of little things that need to be remembered. First of all, a truck will have to be able to get into your property, towing a chipper, and also be able to turn around. When it comes to the pile, it shouldn't be more than about four or five feet high. So it's easier for them to get hold of it rather than having something that's six to eight to 10 feet high. Thirdly, make sure that the ends of the branches are facing out to where the chipper will be. If they're higgledy-piggledy all over the place, don't expect cheerful, cooperative people. They will still be very nice, but that makes their work much, much harder. So having it four feet high, how long it 
the, the line is doesn't matter. Four feet high with the branches facing out to where the chipper will be is the most important thing to do. It's designed only for the chipping that is the, the, the pruning and the clippings that are being done in order to create defensible space. If you have an orchard and you decide that you want to get rid of all your orchard, no, that's not quite the idea. When you're calling the Fire Safe Council, uh, make sure it's as early as possible. They will start determined by the weather rather than by the months. And when you stack it, obviously for your own safety, stack it preferably 50 to 100 feet away rather than 10, 15 feet from the house. I know a lot of your pruning will be done close to the house, which is where you're creating your defensible space. But you don't want to stack the dead stuff there that's dry and uh, likely to catch fire embers and then set fire to your house. So make sure you get it at least 50 feet away from the house, further if you can. Being a defensible space advisor has been an extremely satisfying job. I must make this distinction though. A defensible space advisor is different from a defensible space inspector. Inspectors are employed by the county. What they say can carry the weight of law and they can issue citations if necessary, from what I understand. A, an advisor merely gives you from the training that he or she has received all the things that would help your property to be a lot safer and your structure to be a lot safer. And if you've ever thought, uh, oh, that sounds interesting, I might do that sometime, it's very worthwhile. I have to tell you that the most recent group we had was the largest group that we've ever had in a training course. There were almost 100 people. And I think that was because they were um, possibly motivated, inspired, frightened by the campfire, the paradise fire, as everybody calls it. They don't want that to happen to themselves. So these people come in, they'll spend a day learning from experts, from the fire department, uh, the defensible space office, insurers, uh, plant experts and so on, the things that will be of most value to them in helping people to create a, a safer environment for themselves. Then the next day, which is a half day, the groups, uh, the, the, the training class would be broken up into groups, taken out with a, an experienced advisor and they will examine a house. They will inspect it and they will look at all the things according to what they've just learned. And the advisor will say, yes, that's very good. That's, that's a good point to make. Um, what else do you think might be uh, necessary around here? Uh, would you think that this should be taken? And so you're learning on the job, literally. And that's the advice that they take with them. Now, when people have left the class, even after having done this advisable inspection, they're sometimes a little bit apprehensive about going out on their own. So the Fire Safe Council will provide an experienced advisor to go out with them and have somebody sh uh, shadow them and see how it's done. Maybe it'll be one or two times and then the new recruit will take over and the advisor will be there just to give them that extra bit of uh, advice. So you don't have to feel that you're going to be thrown to the wolves after having been given your brief training, which is pretty intense training, a lot to do. I don't know what the recent number is, but I have heard, I know when um, I was uh, working uh, 
office work as well as going out into the fields. There were over 150, but obviously now, if you add to it the most recent group, we're talking about some, I'm guessing, somewhere between 250 and 300 people. Not all of whom are going to be comfortable going out and doing it. A lot of the people did the course just so they would know more about their own home, which I think is admirable. But if they're not available also as volunteers, it means they're relying on maybe 5% or 10% of that number. And the numbers of people who are requesting help with the advice on their house is a lot more, and it started a lot earlier this year than ever before. I've never known it to start two or three months in advance of the fire season. Well, trickling out is a very good thing, but in addition to it just happening spontaneously when one person sees another person or the person who got the advisory visit says to his neighbour, oh, this is what I've done, this is what uh, I've had done, um, they may be inspired. But we also encourage people to form what we call firewise communities which means that a specific area and group of people will get together to be mutually supportive and they will help each other and hold each other accountable, which I think is a great idea. And I think most of us tend to respond to peer pressure. And if you're the only place that looks messy with long grass in front of your house, um, one of your neighbours is probably going to be a little bit outspoken and say, uh, hey, you're letting the rest of us down, mate. You better do something about it. People who are willing to come into the office who are not anxious about going out and doing advisories uh, are always welcome. We, we have a, a core paid staff who are really overworked and need all the support they can get. And almost every time I walk into the office, there's somebody that I haven't seen and I'll introduce myself and they'll say, oh, I'm a volunteer here. And it's wonderful to, to see high school kids do it, seniors do it, people on vacations do it. It's, they, they just want to feel involved. I think everybody recognises the need to do it. And when they have the willingness to do it, this is a great vehicle for them to put their desire to do it and their willingness to do it into a very practical advantage. It's surprising how enthusiastic the people in the office are and the advisors who are really involved in it and are as passionately engaged in it as I am. Um, so if you decide to be a volunteer and you know nothing about it, believe me, they will tell you everything and perhaps a lot more than you need to know or that you can possibly take in. But you will pick it up by osmosis. It's just one of those wonderful things. And you'll hear the conversations going on between. And if you are willing enough to learn and ask questions, you'll be given the opportunity to find out so much which will help you in your own home, protecting your own home and your own property. Well, I sometimes come across, I apologise to all those people that I've visited and I've been a bit of a shock to them because Americans, generally speaking, are very polite. And I, I think sometimes I'm a little bit too brief, blunt and brutal. And I'll say, do you know the two biggest dangers in the wildfire season? And then they'll venture a guess and I'll say, no, ignorance and apathy. Ignorance of what a fire can do, and then when a fire comes, what to do about it. And unfortunately, there's also a group who are just so apathetic. They, they say, um, oh, it won't happen to me. We haven't had a fire through here for over 100 years. So it makes you think, it's, it's unfortunate. And I ask themselves, well, are you sure that there's not going to be a fire in your area 
during this wildfire season? Um, or if there is a fire, that your house won't catch fire? Um, or that if there's a mandatory evacuation and you must be ready ahead of time for your evacuation, that's very important, um, that you'll get out safely? And when they realize, no, I hadn't really considered those things, it helps them to see the importance of it. For people who are not properly prepared for a wildfire, who have not done a defensible space for the first five feet, remove all the flammable material up to the next 30 feet where you've got to prune up your trees, remove bushes, any fallen timber, and then ideally, because not all properties are big enough to have this, out 100 feet around your structure, um, you've got to be ready at any time, because you don't know when the fire is going to come. Obviously, the people in paradise didn't expect a fire to come within three hours and just take out the whole town. So make sure you get hold of material which you can get from the Fire Safe Council, or f if you uh, go online to uh, mynevadacounty.com, and you can download materials there how to prepare for evacuation. Uh, get yourself ready. If you're hoping that a fire won't come, you should still get ready just in case it does. The uh, best thing to do is to have a combination of both of those things. Make yourself as safe as possible by creating a, a fire-resistant house and then the area at least within the first 30 feet around it and also prepare for evacuation well ahead of time. If you're fortunate enough to get 24 hours notice, then you'll get out safely. If you leave it for the last three hours, at least if you're prepared, you'll be able to grab the important things and get out before the fire engulfs your area. I think most people, when they think about defensible space, don't think that their roof is the first area that they should be paying attention to. Round figures, because you can't give accurate figures, no matter how um, many post-fire analyses there have been, that your roof is the most vulnerable area, the area where you're most likely to have a fire start. And 80% of the fires start on the roof. And again, round figures, 80% of the fires that start up there are from embers or firebrands. And 80% of the time it's because people have not cleaned their roofs. So round figures, maybe 40, 60, 50, but the point is your roof is your most vulnerable area. What is on it? as the, the, the greatest cause of the fire, and embers are the things that will start it. Not the radiant heat, not the flames. In fact, the Chaparral Society had an article not so long ago that said flames rarely or never are the initial cause of a fire in a home. Before then, you've had the firebrands land on your house on the property around a continuous line of fuel, which has brought the flames up there, but it's the embers that started it. One of the things that I like to say to my people when they say, well, what have I got to clear? And I say, righto, um, you may not remember Mission Impossible, but your assignment, if you should choose to accept it, is to Build the biggest bonfire you can with all the combustible material that you can find within 30 feet of your house. If that's the case, then an ember can land in that same material, which may even be in your green bushes that has a whole lot of leaves at the bottom and uh, dead twigs and so on. Your little embers can find that same material and set it on fire. 
which then leads to the question, well, what plants should I remove? If you can limb it up and there's nothing flammable underneath it, then you can leave that green plant, especially if it's deciduous, because deciduous plants have a lot more moisture in them and in their leaves. They're slower to catch fire and slower to burn. But don't rely on that. Clear underneath them and prune them up. Very important. And if you want to know what other plants you should take out, wait until your bonfire is burned down. Get a shovel full, not a plastic shovel, a metal shovel full of those embers and throw them on the plant that you were not going to take out. If it bursts into flame, perhaps you should take that out. I can understand and if I were building a house without firewise knowledge, I'd probably do the same thing. I'm going to put my house really close to the slope because it'll maximize my view. Um, just forgetting for the moment that fires race up hills and your house is right on the edge of that. Now you'll find differing um, estimations as to how far back you should set your house from a slope. The minimum would be 130, sorry, 30 feet, minimum 30 feet. Uh, you can go maybe 150 feet back if you've got a five acre block. And not only do you set it back in case the wildfire comes up and there's a lot of brush that you haven't cleared and the wind is going to be roaring up there because the hot air rises and brings in cold air underneath it and that pushes it up 50, 100 miles an hour. But you also have to consider what is on that slope. The steeper the slope, the further apart your bushes and your trees should be. Uh, you can contact uh, CAL FIRE, uh, Nevada County Fire Department, uh, Fire Safe Council, and they can refer you to uh, websites where you can calculate how far apart your bushes should be, how far apart your trees should be, because that's when you will get, if you have not cleared underneath your trees and uh, shrubs on that slope, fires will go up into the tree and then create a crown fire, which will then travel a lot further and blow embers a lot further, keeping in mind that embers can come from over a mile away. So you don't want to create a situation or neglect to remedy a situation where a fire is going to do exactly that thing. If you are going to deal with a house that's already close to a slope, it's recommended by fire departments that you create a non-flammable barrier, whether it's rocks or uh, a brick wall or concrete wall, that will prevent the fire from jumping up, or you have a grass fire that'll uh, have a continuous line of fire to your house, pushed by the, the wind coming up the slope. One of the things that I'd like to add to that, as far as safety on your slopes, the, in one of the uh, training videos that I saw, it was very sad that a man had neglected to clear his slope below him because he had uh, covered with what he thought was a great plant to have there, a succulent, uh, an ice plant, pig face, misembryanthemum, whatever name you want to call it. And he thought, well, that's how it got so much water in it. Forgetting, of course, that that was the green on the top, but underneath it was all the dead vegetation. That's what caught fire. That's what dried out the plants above it, and it continued in, in less than an hour. It had come up a slope of 120, 150 feet and burned his house. Wow. So it's best to have as close to bare earth or nothing more than it's recommended three to six inches of what's called duff, the stuff that's going to burn.
Unfortunately, people have misinterpreted the idea of clearing around the house, whether it's on a slope or whether it's on flat land. And so they will practically denude it. They will cut down trees for 50 feet back, denude the whole area, which in fact creates a worse situation for your home. Because now you've got nothing to block fire embers and firebrands that are coming in. The recommended thing, if you've got a big enough property, is to have three to five rows of vegetation, low, medium, high, medium, low, which will stop the fire coming straight up, which will catch the embers, it'll stop the turbulence that comes in and uh, brings all the, the fire embers. And so they cut back too much, which is unfortunate. They will cut back or take out their grass, plants that they didn't need to take out. And when they think about this afterwards, they resent this. They'll, they'll preach the gospel of, no, no, it's just a waste of time. Or they will think about what they'll have to do and not do it at all. And so they leave what they should have taken out. If they get a defensible space advisor out there to instruct them on what they're doing and say, no, you don't need to take that out. Yes, you do need to take out the juniper. Yes, you do need to take out, and I call anything pine trees, cedars, spruces, cypress, um, juniper, all of those, I call those conifers to save having to go through each one each time. They're your biggest problem because they've, they've got all the oil in it and, and turpentine, I think it's called, which is highly flammable. You want those as far away from your place as possible. But even there, you don't have to be ridiculous about it. You know, 20 to 30 feet away, you're fine. You don't need to take it all the way back and clear it out completely. I haven't had any experience with them. I know of people who've had them on their roofs. Uh, I've read um, material from Australia where, where they've used them. I've read about people who've been in the Paradise Fire that have used them, and it seems that they are effective. In the event that you've got 50, 100 mile per hour winds, there's a possibility that the spray which is supposed to be going over your roof may in fact get blown away from that. So don't rely on it entirely. Still be vigilant, still make sure that you've cleared all the debris, the pine needles, the leaves off your roof. Make sure that your gutters are cleared. But I still think it's a good idea and I would never say to anyone, don't put them on your roof, it's a waste of time. I think the order in which people need to address the house if they have a limited amount of time, resources, energy. First of all, your roof. Secondly, any decks if you have them and what's on the decks. And that's everything. You may have a metal uh, outdoor set, but if you've got flammable cushions, you've just defeated half the purpose. Uh, coir matting or other flammable doormats, which are right at your front door get everything, anything that's flammable, um, flower boxes, uh, deck chairs. If the fire is almost on you, throw them over the, the, the deck as, way as, far, as far away as possible and make your house less vulnerable to flames. Oh... I, talking about decks, please, please, please make sure that what you have under the deck is non-flammable. I've seen paint cans, fuel cans, spare timber, furniture, wooden ladders, plastic toys. They'd make a great bonfire. I think everything would burn really well there. If it's going to burn out there, then it's going to burn underneath your deck. And your deck is attached to your house. When you think about your house, think, I, I use the expression, two arms out, walk about. 
If you put your hand on the wall of the house and stretch out your other arm, because I'm very short, I have to sort of jump out a little bit further, and walk around your house. And if it's attached to the house, that's part of the house. So walk around your fence and your pergolas and any garages and uh, woodsheds and anything else. That's all your house. Treat that as your house. Get everything away from that. But especially stuff that's under decks, under stairs. And if you want to be really safe, then make sure that it's all um, covered with mesh on the outside. Not lattice work, whether it's plastic or wood, it's still going to burn. If you want to leave that there, then put the mesh on this side, not the inside. It may not make your lattice look very good, but it's going to be safer. And make sure it's one eighth inch or one sixteenth inch. Some people worry that one sixteenth is going to be too fine and that stuff will get in it and you'll have to be cleaning it forever. Just think about the insect screens that you have on your windows and on your, your front door. They're one sixteenth inch. They get clogged up. They don't have to get, well, maybe once every 10 to 15 years. So make sure it's metal, steel, or aluminum. One of my uh, the people that uh, I, I went to visit to give advice to had been proactive and he had gotten aluminum foil, uh, one eighth, one sixteenth inch, lighter gauge and heavier gauge. And he took the lighter gauge and held it over the gas burner of his uh, stovetop, the kitchen. It didn't burn. Aluminum. I was very surprised. We're always told steel mesh uh, in, a, in a defensible space training. But make sure that it's all covered so that nothing can blow in. Make sure it goes down to the ground. And while we're talking about that, vents are probably one of the biggest sources of embers getting into a house. And that includes your laundry vent. If you've got one where during the drying process, the vent opens, after it uh, is finished, the vent closes, you're fine. Otherwise, put a covering of mesh over it. That'll get into that as well. With your vents, you don't have to necessarily remove the vent. Uh, you can get some of this mesh and just tack on the outside. Or you can buy a bigger mesh vent in a steel frame, not in a plastic frame or a wooden frame, and just tack it over there so you don't have to remove your old ones. One of the things that I'm asked frequently by people whom I visit and they complain about a lot is my neighbor, sort of nodding in a direction, has got all that stuff over there and I've asked them several times to please move it or cut it down or take care of it and they won't. What can I do? Well, if you've asked them politely and they refuse to do anything about it, you could suggest to them, you, you realize that your property is only as safe as mine and I'm going to make it as fire resistant as possible. And likewise, my property is only as safe as yours. The heat from your property can cause my house to burn and likewise, Mine can cause your house to burn. So let's work together. If they are reluctant to do anything or quite unobliging, then you can contact the county. And there is an ordinance now which was brought in in 2013. And I think it's ordinance number 2463, which talks about the responsibilities of neighbors and your rights when somebody has uh, what is uh, hazardous vegetation and they are obliged to remove it 30 feet back from your property. Otherwise they can be sited and it will 
happened in the union uh, within the last few months. Uh, a woman who had been concerned about 30 or 40 dead digger pines on the neighbour's property had complained about it. The county contacted her and said, you have to remove those, get a quote. And she got two quotes, $19,000 and up to 29000 I think it was. I, don't, don't quote me exactly on the figures. And she said, no, I can't afford that. The county said, you have to do something about it. If you refuse to do it, we'll send someone to do it and you'll have to pay for it. So ultimately, somebody went in, took out only 22 of the worst offenders and it's costing her $39,000. And so now they've attached a lien to the property. I don't want anyone to be in that situation. So if the two of you can work together in a neighbor to neighbor situation, you're going to be a lot better off. Just recently, I've come up with the concept which I call the compass agreement. Your home is there. You have neighbors on both sides, fore and aft. And you've got the four corners as well. So if the eight of you make an agreement, you will all help each other. What is a daunting job for one person, for eight people becomes relatively simple. And then we move from one property to the next, to the next, to the next. And, the, and so everybody has benefited from it. And if those people who've now been part of that group of eight extend that same concept around them exponentially, you're going to have a completely fire safe council. You will still find people who say, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to lose my privacy. I don't want to lose my, the beauty of this. And part of my brief, blunt and brutal thing is, well, I can tell you how long they'll be able to enjoy it. That's until the fire comes and burns it down and their house as well. It's sad. They, don't they realize that, they, they obviously don't realize that they, they will lose it in the event of a fire. And it's very sad. And there are ways to still maintain the beauty of their properties and their view and their privacy without doing all the terrible things that they think they're going to have to do, which is where we as defensible space advisors can guide them. With regard to mandatory evacuation, I think by and large, everybody should do what they're told to do. It's just good, plain common sense. If you've created a very well-prepared home and you've gotten all the stuff off your roof and you're, you're, you're 30 to 100 feet back, there's a good chance that even in a wildfire coming right through, your house won't burn because there's nothing to burn it. There may be a few scorch marks here and there. But by and large, I think your house will survive. And you will too if you get out in time. As Fire Safety Council Defensible Space Advisors, our focus is on creating safety in the structure and then the surrounds. We are not experts at all in mandatory evacuation, but there is plenty of literature on the Fire Safe Council's uh, website and my Nevada County and CAL FIRE. And read it, take it to heart and act on it. Don't put it off. We don't know when the next fire will be. I was talking to some firefighters just a couple of days ago and they said, we've already had three fires this year. Already. We're not into the fire season yet. So do it now.